Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here for our briefing on the intersection between geoscience research and the fundamental role it plays in informing and protecting our national security. My name is Chris McEntee. I'm the executive director and CEO of the American Geophysical Union. For those of you who don't know us, although I imagine those in the room do, we are the world's largest um, earth and space scientist society with 60,000 members around the world who study all aspects of earth, space, water, atmospheres, sun, planets, and universes. And our mission is science for the benefit of humanity. Many of you, like me, being a, I'm not a geoscientist, before I started working at AGU six years ago, I never really had a great understanding of how much our national security relies on the basic and applied research which occurs in the earth and space sciences. And you're gonna hear from our speakers today that science provides us with many benefits. Science helps us to prepare for known and unknown risk by helping us assess, assess the potential severity and threats of natural hazards and to better confront old challenges and emerging threats. Advancements in sciences have also led to leaps in military capabilities and defense strategies, helping to ensure that when our military acts, it is with the best knowledge currently available. These advances help us save money, protect resources, and most importantly, protect lives. Although all of our speakers today will be discussing national security, they're all scientists whose work was funded by the federal government science agencies. Many of these agencies, such as the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, Office of Science, and the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration fund both basic and applied research. These agencies' investments in basic research are so critical because this research can often become the building blocks for future discovery and applications such as ways that you're gonna hear about today that protect our national security. You're gonna hear from three outstanding speakers about how their basic research in the earth and space sciences later contributed to the work being done by our national agencies that keep us secure as a country. Now I'm gonna to turn to our speakers. I'm gonna introduce each of them um, as they come up to speak. Um, the first one is Dr. Eric Webb. He manages Sandia's National Laboratories Geoscience Research and Applications Group, doing research on geological and atmospheric science, fossil energy, geoengineering, nuclear repositories, underground structure detection, geothermal energy, and treaty verification. He also manages the lab's border security portfolio and engagement with the latest strategic arms reduction treaty ratification between the United States and Russia. Dr. Webb has a Master's of Science and a PhD in hydrogeology from the University of Wisconsin and has worked for a vast array of the United States foreign and commercial organization. Dr. Webb. It's a privilege to be with you today. Um, many of you know about Sandia National Labs. We are a, an organization that's sponsored by the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration. We have a 60, 65 year history that began as a, as a function of, a, of an offshoot of Los Alamos National Lab. We were the assembly line for nuclear weapons post-World War II. After about a two-year uh, activity, President Truman asked Bell Laboratories, then Western Electric, to take over responsibility for the engineering of nuclear weapons. And from that point forward, we've been known as Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, we have, in within our sort of decadal history that you can see on the slides, an evolving set of national security uh, responsibilities. 60% of our laboratory is still dedicated to nuclear weapons engineering activities, including the life extension programs. But as we've moved through these decadal activities, the, ex the number of threats that our nation faces have expanded. And as we've, especially in the last two decades, it's been a proliferation of issues. In order to be prepared for the current and whatever is going to come next, we have established seven areas of science that we sustain as research foundations. 
You'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner of these slides, geoscience is listed as one of those research foundations. The purpose of that is that almost all of our national security activities are at the intersection of human activities and natural systems. I'd like to have the time with you to go through each and every one of the security activities that we can impact through our geoscience activities, but rather than do that, let me just give an overview and then I'd like to walk through one example. You'll see things that will probably be, uh, you'd probably easily accept in the bottom half of this slide. We are clearly involved in energy research around repositories and nuclear waste, climate and environment activities. We run for the DOE's Office of Science our climate monitoring activities on the North Slope of Alaska. But on the upper half of this slide, you'll begin to see our national security activities. We work extensively in nuclear nonproliferation the uh, tracking, as well as other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, bio and chem weapons. We are in support of homeland security activities and, of course, in the national defense. The pictures that I've chosen to show have to do with remote sensing activities. Uh, we're, we're using an extensive set of UAV-based sensing, uh, and this bomb you see is the B-61 nuclear weapon. Now, Underpinning all of these security activities, I have roughly 250 geoscience professionals. The vast majority of them have advanced degrees, PhDs. And we view our institution as a place to, for the nation to turn as a last resort in looking at a, a new challenges which we don't have solutions. I have to have very well prepared individuals Rather than sort of walk you through a programmatic slide, what I would like to do is to make the point that our national security relies on basic science investments to prepare people and provide this basic knowledge base. With her permission, I'm going to walk you through this story using an individual. This is Hunter Knox. She's not with us today. I, I think she'd be embarrassed to actually see her face on the picture. But I would like to show you the career of just one of these 250 people and how the basic sciences has helped her prepare for her current role. This is a press release that was uh, issued in April, the end of April. It talks about the National Nuclear Security Administration's fifth experiment at the Nevada nuclear test site where we're running something called the source physics experiment. This is a set of scientific activities that produce the computer and field tools needed to monitor other people's nuclear tests. You're familiar with the experimental activities that are underway in North Korea around nuclear weapons? In order to have confidence not only in the detection of those nuclear tests, but also in being able to discern exactly what those bombs are, their capabilities, things we should be concerned about, we have to understand and have the toolbox in place when those things happen, not only in North Korea, but in other countries. The source physics experiment is a collaborative set of activities that are open. We share this with our uh, global nuclear detection partners, and we run these tests at the Nevada test site. In the lower left, you'll see Hunter setting up a, a shallow seismic array she is our local expert for shallow seismic detection. She's also an expert in taking very large data sets, as much as 30, 40 terabyte data sets, and almost instantaneously having an answer that could then go to the president so he can talk to the national security ramifications of a given test. Where does she come from? How did she get to be in that position? Okay, I'm not sure it's, it's appropriate for me to show Hunter at field camp as an undergraduate student, but she started her, her academic career at the Colorado School of Mines. She was predominantly self-funded going through school, but in her academic work, she had to have access to equipment, cutting-edge equipment that came through two organizations, IRIS and Pascal, which are not governmental organizations, but were entirely dependent on grants from the National Science Foundation. And so her fundamental access to this equipment was made available during her undergraduate. 
As she moved into her master's and PhD work, she moved to the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which does not look like these pictures. Uh, it's in the middle of the desert in New Mexico. But from there, she was able to work with, again, uh, organizations sponsored by NSF and then a direct NSF early career grant to do work on Mount Erebus, which is in uh, Antarctica. It's an active volcano in Antarctica where she learned to do, again, very large data set manipulation and the implementation of shallow seismic arrays. This was a series of four or five years of work. During that same period of time, she received a, an additional NSF early career grant that allowed her to be involved in a special set of workshops in Hawaii. If I were primarily working in Antarctica, I would be trying to go to Hawaii, uh, where she actually established the working relationships that have carried her to her current position. She would not be in our current roles without these relationships. Now, we hired Hunter. I won't go through her entire career, but she has actively returned uh, to sponsor additional students. And so what you see here, Rebecca Lee, that's been working with us for three years, developing new algorithms. Uh, she's taken what she knows to work on climate change issues. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see them appropriately fighting off mosquitoes in the north of Fairbanks, Alaska, as they implement a permafrost measurement activity. And in this lower right-hand corner, you'll see a, a, a spout of water that is about 40 feet tall. And that particular set of experiments is part of the Department of Energy's new subsurface science program, uh, where Hunter m manages a team of four national laboratories, scientists that are looking at how we uh, measure uh, hydraulic fracking activities. And so this was a fracking experiment. So she's able to use these for a lot of things, but we get this kind of person from an NSF investment. So this is how I can tell the story about one individual. Okay? I believe that I can tell this story of about two-thirds of the people that currently work at Sandia in our geosciences. My personal story has, follows a similar track. The point I'd like to make is that of our many geoscientists, most of these individuals receive some training and support from their development through U.S. government in, uh, investments in basic scientists. That pipeline of talent for our, our future national security depends on the basic science investments today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Webb, uh, for making that really personal connection between the investment in basic science and individuals and then on to how it protects our national security and for showing us all the really cool places that geoscientists um, get to work. Next we have Dr. Mo Morris Cohen. He's an assistant professor of electrical engineering at Georgia Tech. He holds bachelor's and PhD degrees from Stanford University where he served until a research as a research scientist until 2013. Dr. Cohen was a AAAS Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation. He's the author of more than 50 journal publications and serves on the Executive Committee of the Atmospheric and Space Electricity Focus Group of the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Cohen. All right, well, good morning. Uh, I want to start by thanking the AGU for inviting me to speak on this uh, a very important topic, which is a geospace research and national security. Now, you may be wondering why I have a picture of lightning on this front slide when I'm going to be talking about geospace. So my scientific background is the physics of lightning and its various implications, which include uh, impacts in a space environment. And uh, uh, that's sort of a surprising aspect that I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. So, all right. So uh, the general topic here is that geospace research is very important for American security. And there's really two points that I'd like to uh, bring home today. The first is that what happens in space has implications on Earth. And there's a few different mechanisms for that. There's uh, space weather. Uh, there's some impacts on the ground, including uh, you know, potential for massive power outages that uh, um, you know, I think that, you know, the geoscience community is trying to contribute to understanding that. And the second point is that basic science, which is science really just for the sake of learning science, ends up leading to some very surprise implications and some surprise applications that the uh, Department of Defense then leverages. And I'm going to give sort of three 
personal examples from my own area on uh, navigation reliability, satellite protection, as well as um, uh, antenna performance. Uh, so, you know, this is sort of a diagram that, uh, you know, shows what the space environment is like. And we think of space as being sort of empty, vast, nothing vacuum. Uh, it's not really like that. Space is actually a pretty rough neighborhood. Uh, what happens is the sun is at any given time spewing out this, uh, uh, this massive, you know, ball of particles and, uh, uh, you know, high energy, um, you know, radiation. It's called the solar wind. It's, it streams toward the earth. Uh, what happens is when it hits the sort of neighborhood surrounding the Earth, it encounters the magnetic field of the Earth, which luckily protects us, and all that solar wind is kind of diverted around the edges so it doesn't reach the ground, which is good, you know, very good for us. Um, but that whole process of you know, smacking into the Earth and being diverted around uh, creates this whole electrical response, and that phenomenon of all that electrical response around the Earth is called space weather. And, and the Earth in this diagram is that sort of little, oops, sorry, that uh, little speck in the middle. And you can see how big the space environment is surrounding us. Uh, so uh, we call this space weather not because it's like the weather on Earth with you know, tornadoes and, and rain and stuff like that, but there are storms of, of particles um, that, can, that can sort of occur in space when the sun's solar wind sort of goes way up for a period of, uh, of, of days or hours. So if we go to the next slide, there are some, some very beautiful implications of this that we can see. Uh, these are, you know, northern lights that you can see at, uh, at high latitudes, and that's sort of a direct visual um, result of the sun's influence on the space environment. Unfortunately, if you go to the next slide, some of the effects of space weather are not so good, are not so beautiful. Uh, so satellites that have to fly through this environment surrounding the Earth are constantly being bombarded by this radiation. They're not protected the way we are on the ground. Uh, so over time, they're degraded and then destroyed. Uh, there can be communications failures from all that extra electrical activity uh, you know, in the space environment. Uh, there can be GPS outages in certain regions as a result of this uh, when one of these uh, you know, solar storms occurs. Uh, it's, it's well known that air traffic has to divert from certain areas uh, during some of these periods. And the, sort of the, the most troubling one, I would say, is the potential for large-scale power outages. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example. Well, we know that this has happened. Uh, back in 1989, there was a, a pretty strong space weather storm that caused about a nine-hour long power outage over much of Quebec. Uh, now, we were you know, lucky in that case, the storm wasn't so strong that it affected us here in the U.S. The, generally, the stronger the storm is, the further south its effects go. Uh, so this one didn't reach us. Uh, but uh, there, there has been a study by the National Academy uh, of Sciences that basically took uh, a very old event that, that uh, occurred in, in 1859 called the Carrington event, uh, which did knock out some telegraphs and projected if, if that were to happen today, there would be a pretty you know, long scale power outage for about 130 uh, or so million people. Uh, one of the challenges is that the power grid is very interconnected, so a failure in one area can kind of cascade and affect large regions. So the geoscience community were actively engaged in trying to understand this and try to predict this a little bit better. Uh, and that's sort of a, a very active area. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, you know, the, the, the second point that, that I'd, I'd like to talk about is the role of basic science. So before, you know, we know there's a problem and we know that what we're trying to solve. But a lot of the science we do is just done for the, for the sake of understanding things that we don't know. It's, it's pure exploration. But the surprising thing is that in my own experience, I can name at least three aspects where the, the, the sort of uh, just pure scale investigation has led to unexpected advances that the DOD has then taken advantage of. Uh, so one example has to do with navigation. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with GPS. Uh, it has revolutionized uh, you know, pretty much everything we do. It's in our cars. It's in our phones. Um, unfortunately, GPS is a very, very weak signal. It's pretty easy to jam. It's pretty easy to, uh, to spoof. Uh, for maybe $15, I can go out and I can buy a GPS jammer that will knock out the signal over probably a good chunk of this building, if not more. Um, as you may imagine, this is a big problem for the DOD, which is very reliant uh, on GPS. So one of the solutions that, uh, that uh, is being investigated right now actually has to do with lightning. So for decades, uh, scientists you know, funded by the National Science Foundation were studying lightning and found that there were these radio pulses that were coming from lightning that you could detect literally thousands of miles away. It was uh, you know, a sort of pretty interesting discovery when, when it first came about. So right now, there's an active program at DARPA to try to leverage that 
and uh, you know, using that same capability the way Lightning does, we can sort of build a GPS-like system with, you know, with a network of transmitters on the ground instead of satellites. So think about replacing satellites with, uh, with ground signals. And again, that was a, a surprise result that uh, uh, you would never have thought that Lightning would ever have a connection to navigation, but there it was. Um, second example uh, has to do with satellites. So I mentioned that satellites, they have to fly through this, uh, uh, this very energetic region in space, and they're often degraded and destroyed over time, when one of the, particularly when one of these space weather storms happen. So the natural question to ask is, uh, well, how do we protect satellites? Can we do anything to bring things back down to normal when one of these space weather storms happen? And again, the answer to that question actually came from studying lightning, uh, purely for its own sake. I was discovered a few decades ago that the same radio pulse from lightning escapes into space and actually removes some of that radiation and brings things back down to normal. So by studying the physics of how lightning does it, and lightning is basically nature's trick for bringing things back down to normal, we can begin to engineer a system ourselves to protect satellites and extend their lifetimes. And that's an active program that the, the Air Force is now investigating, um, you know, looking at this and other aspects. And the third example, which is a transition even outside of, of geoscience, has to do with, that, with antennas. So I did my PhD research studying the, the radio waves from lightning and how they, how they interact with the upper atmosphere. Uh, and I did this with a facility um, in Alaska called HARP, which uh, basically you know, used the upper atmosphere where, this, where there is this material called a plasma, which is kind of like what's in fluorescent light bulbs. Um, it's uh, basically an energized gas. So through studying all those interactions, I sort of came up with an idea of using, this, uh, of using a plasma to actually build an antenna. And the, wh what ends up happening is there's this long-standing problem amongst, uh, amongst you know, engineers who are building antennas, that you can either make an antenna really efficient or you can make it really small, but you pretty much can never have both. Uh, and there's always uh, a trade-off there. So by leveraging this, our new understanding about plasmas and how they work and how we can uh, and how we can inter interact from that, we sort of launched a whole program that's completely outside the realm of geoscience. It's purely an engineering uh, program that's now being funded by the Navy. So that's, that's an impact that's even outside the, the geoscience that, again, came out of the geoscience result. Uh, so I guess what, what, I, what I'd like to close with is, uh, you know, these are three personal examples just from my own experience, but I promise you that I'm not, I'm not special. I'm not, like, somehow unique. I feel like if you, if you go talk to a lot of geoscientists, you'll get lots of stories like this of very surprised applications that come out of very basic, um, you know, pure, pure science. And I think if there's one point that I'd like to leave you with, it's about the, the uh, importance of having both basic research with no particular application in mind fully supported, as well as, you know, a network of, uh, you know, basically applied-based research that can leverage all that. And I think geoscience really contributes to that whole environment. And, um, I think uh, that's where I'd like to leave it, so thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, uh, for that really um, three just examples just from your own work. And when there's several hundred thousand geoscientists around the world, you can imagine that multiplied. But also your third point of showing how you can't just say, we'll cut research over here in this field because it's not that critical, because you made this great compelling art, um, example of how the plasma research now is feeding in with the geoscience research and then to the applied research. Our third speaker is Dr. F. Martin Relf. Um, he is a program director for the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes at the University of California, San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography. The center is leading the development and implementation of new research and application capabilities focused on extreme weather and climate events in the Western United States, especially those affecting water supply, flood risk, and related water, weather climate sensitive sectors. Dr. Ralph previously served as the chief of the water cycle branch at NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory in Colorado. Dr. Ralph. Good morning, and thank you also to AGU for the opportunity to share some of this experience with the group here, and thanks you, for you t attending today. I think uh, what I'm going to do here is relate a little bit of a personal story of how a particular science topic has emerged and what some of its implications are. And the topic is around something we now call atmospheric rivers, which are these regions in the atmosphere a couple hundred miles wide that are really full of water vapor 
and the horizontal winds are very strong. And it turns out they, in effect, are transporting water vapor like, an, like a terrestrial river, but instead of as liquid, it's as water vapor. And in fact, a typical atmospheric river can transport about 20 times as much water as the Mississippi River does, but it's doing it as vapor instead of liquid. It's hugely important for the global climate, for weather prediction, and for water. So I'm gonna go through the story here a little bit of how uh, use-inspired research, and use-inspired, I use that term to respect the fact that many scientists I work with are driven, in addition to the basic curiosity like uh, Professor Cohen spoke so eloquently about, but also about the idea that that can have an impact in their communities and in our economy and in our nation and world. How that research has now generated the potential to revolutionize water management in the West. In particular, we face, we've been facing a major drought in California and much of the West. And this, I'll tell you at the end of the story, is related to how uh, we might be able to do better in the future. There's a lot of work to be done. It's very much an idea, not a proven thing. But I want to walk you through that story a little bit. So first of all, I want to highlight the fact that the, the work on atmospheric rivers emerged from over a decade of investment and activity from uh, basic to applied research funding from NOAA, the Department of Energy, NASA, the Navy, NSF, California Department of Water Resources, even a local water agency. It's this consortium of different funding sources that have led to different elements of the work that we've done uh, that has allowed us to discover this uh, phenomena, atmospheric rivers, and what it could, uh, what it could really uh, help us with. In addition, a lot of that work really depends on long-term measurements. One of the least sexy things to support, I can imagine, is collecting simple data day after day after day, even with very simple tools, as well as very complex ones. Sometimes it's expensive, sometimes it's inexpensive, but it's often not very sexy. Yet, I can tell you, going, it, the discoveries on atmospheric rivers would not have been possible had we not had multi-decade long time series of very good measurements of precipitation, of the weather, and of satellite data uh, looking over the ocean. So those long-term records are really important, and my colleagues would very much appreciate, as would I, continued support for those, even though they're not often as sexy as some others. I'd like to add that uh, the current predictive skill for atmospheric rivers is something we think now has the potential to help reservoir operators maybe make some decisions they wouldn't have in the past that could allow for greater water supply and increased flood control. I say this very cautiously that it's just an idea right now. We've formed a committee, I'll share that with you in a moment, of very technical people and we're assessing the viability of this idea. And it's a bit of a breakthrough in water management because the very risk averse community uh, for flood control reasons, for obvious uh, background, they don't want to increase risk of flooding. It can kill people, it can ruin the economy of a region, it can be very devastating. But we we're looking at how to use existing infrastructure, reservoirs, dams, and the like, in new ways to enable better water supply and even improve flood control. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But our first step is to say, based on current forecast skill for these atmospheric rivers, can we improve uh, water management? And then the next question is, if we can improve the forecast skill substantially, can we enable even greater use of these existing facilities? And right now, there's an exciting program called Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. And we have support from the US Army Corps of Engineers. And this is really about water security, by the way, from a national security standpoint. Water is really the bread and butter in the West, in particular, of much of the economy and much of our viability as a, as a nation. So this support from the Corps of Engineers is allowing a team to form up of technical people from hydrology, meteorology, economics, biology, fish depend on water, as well as uh, uh, other fields to work together to try to assess the viability of this idea. And it's a very important funding source for us and thank you for, the, uh, for Congress for appropriating it and for the agency, the Corps of Engineers for uh, initiating this work. It's allowing us to work with USGS, the US Bureau of Reclamation, as well as state and local agencies. What is an atmospheric river? Is a picture's worth a thousand words. On the left here, we see an image from a paper a few years back, uh, which shows the water vapor over the ocean as measured by a satellite system. It's actually a milita military satellite system with a sensor on it that's very useful for civilian applications. And this is to measure water vapor over the oceans. 
the colors there, green and orange and yellow, that's large amounts of water vapor. And you see how long and narrow that feature is? Well, imagine the wind blowing along that axis from the ocean to land, and where that water vapor, that atmospheric river hits shore, we get a lot of precipitation. And the dots on that map on the upper left show where heavy, heavy uh, runoff was observed by USGS stream gauges. By the way, there's another one of those not so sexy long-term measurement systems that are vital in so many ways to our nation's well-being. And on the upper right, you see a flood that was induced in, in one region in Northern California called the Russian River. And in the lower right, you see another result that allowed us to compare uh, about a decade or 15 years of satellite-based atmospheric river measurements with daily rainfall measurements at hundreds of sites, across, thousands of sites across the West. And the green color there shows that about half of the rain in that part of California comes each year from just a handful of these land-falling atmospheric rivers. This is one of those discoveries in science, a sort of basic result that we had not realized in meteorology until we did this analysis and had the time and resources to pursue it, special measurements to make, et cetera, that these atmospheric rivers are really the linchpin to western water in many states, in California in particular, but also Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, Alaska as well. So now we understand the phenomena, and we know now these are the cause of floods. They're also the cause of drought. When we're absent atmospheric rivers, we are more likely to fall into drought in the West. So our water management community out West has come to recognize this phenomena is really key, and they are investing. They're looking to the science community, federal and otherwise, to help them uh, develop new tools uh, to provide information on this. One of the things that came out of this work is uh, uh, the formation of a, a steering committee. A, 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 we developed a white paper. We got myself and a couple of other scientists from Scripps Oceanography together, uh, organized a workshop, brought in people from NOAA, the USGS, uh, DOE, a number of federal agencies, and we formed up a steering committee, developed a vision of what were the top priorities scientifically around water in California. So we called it CalWater. But what we learn about in California, like in many cases in science, what you learn in depth in one region is often applicable in much broader regions. But by focusing in one region, it's affordable, it's logistically feasible to actually learn something. So we proposed in a variety of ways to form an experiment, and we carried it out in 2015. And you can see the images here show the Department of Energy aircraft, the NOAA P-3 and G-4 aircraft, NASA ER-2 aircraft, the NOAA ship, the, their key vessel, the Ron Brown, and then uh, the, the image of the DOE Advanced Remote Sensing Facility, which, by the way, DOE put on the NOAA ship. Great example of interagency collaboration helping us pursue the science. You see the ATOF MS sensor at the bottom, an NSF facility, a wind profiler that's from a state-sponsored network, and you can see all of this came together because the science community got together, came up with a plan, worked with the various agencies, this would not have been possible had not the investments in these core facilities been made in each of these agencies. Having come from NOAA, having been a scientist and program manager in NOAA, I know how hard it can be for the agencies to fight for these resources. They are really vital for us to conduct this kind of work, as you're hearing in this presentation. And you can find an article in it in Bulletin of American Meteorological Society I authored with the committee here uh, if you're looking for more information. So classic dilemma in California and in key parts of the West is that we have both flood and drought. And they can happen in the same year, even at the same time. And this image at the top shows a reservoir at extremely low levels. This reservoir is called Lake Mendocino. It's managed jointly by uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers for flood control. And the very same reservoir is managed by a different agency, the Sonoma County Water Agency for water supply. They supply 600,000 people. Uh, an incredible agricultural economy, and let me guess you might know what kind of ag they do there? Yeah, wine. Grapes and wine, it's phenomenal anyhow, great place to work. But also there are endangered species there. The salmon uh, are under uh, guidance to recover them, and NOAA has a major role in fisheries restoration, uh, uh, the endangered species recovery. I want to highlight that upper picture was in uh, July of 2014, and the lower picture was just a couple months earlier, right after an atmospheric river had hit. It turns out this area gets about 8 or 10 ARs per year, ARs short for atmospheric river, and it produces half of the annual precipitation. 
an individual AR can produce a flood in the midst of an annual long-term drought. And that's what happens on this river watershed. Now, how water management works in that area, just uh, take a moment here to explain it. That lower graph shows us what happened over about a two and a half year period at that Lake Mendocino, that top picture a moment ago. And what you see in the blue line is how much water was behind the reservoir uh, every day over two and a half years. The vertical axis is acre feet of water. That's an acre of land with the water a foot deep. That's enough water for about uh, two to four households per year. The green curve is the precipitation accumulating over two and a half years, and you see the big jumps there. Those are the atmospheric rivers. And the gold curve is actually what's called the rule curve, which was established when the dam was built. And it said, here's the rule around which the reservoir operator has to operate. So go forward to uh, the middle there where the circle is, and you see a spike. That's when a big atmospheric river hit, filled the reservoir partway during, so in the winter, by the way, this reservoir has to be kept partly empty for flood control. And then it's allowed to fill in the spring for water supply. And in the middle there, you see a case where an AR made it, it encroached into the flood pool, and the rule says release that water. Little did anybody know that that was the beginning of the California drought. And you can see the blue curve drop off the map there. That's because we didn't get the, the traditional precipitation. We didn't have enough ARs later in that winter. So we formed up a committee uh, called the Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations Committee. And you see a website there if you're interested. And what it did is we formed up, this is not the committee itself, about half of that is. We formed up this group of very technical people who work literally the reservoir operator for that dam from the Corps, from the Sonoma County, and the, um, the folks in the, in the hydrology and atmospheric science community who do the predictions as well. And we got them together and said, what if we could keep some of that water? Now imagine that spike, instead of draining it all the way, we instead could look ahead and see a storm, whether a storm was coming or not. In this case, an AR storm. And if one's not coming, maybe we hedge our bets and we keep, say, 10,000 acre feet of extra water. What we've, de what we've, our committee's now determined is that if we had three to five days lead time on AR landfall in that area, we could safely keep, we believe, that amount of water. And then if the storm is predicted, we have time to drain it safely out of the way. 10,000 acre feet of water is worth $15 million for this one watershed. Now we're only working hard on this watershed right now because we need to prove this out carefully, but the concept clearly has transferability much more broadly. Not everywhere, not every ri river or dam, but we think there's going to be applicability to a number of other facilities. So we're working hard to prove out whether or not this can work. And one thing we've discovered is that atmospheric river predictions have errors in them, and this is, uh, uh, shows an analysis, once again, out of a, a use-inspired research kind of approach that said AR landfall is off and off by plus or minus 500 kilometers. The Russian River is only about 150 kilometers long, and AR is about 500 kilometers wide. So this is basically saying at five days lead time, we don't know whether your watershed is going to be hit or not. That, by the way, that curve becomes the target for major research efforts to improve that forecast skill. I happen to be a scientist and program manager in NOAA when we've had a very similar kind of analysis for the first time of hurricane landfall forecast errors. And over a decade or more, and maybe even 20 years, that curve for hurricanes has dropped substantially. The improvements have been profound. Our hurricane forecast system is much better than it used to be. And we now have articulated a way to pursue that kind of problem for the West Coast. There's no silver bullet here. There's no magic bullet. We need 21st century observations. We need 21st century modeling. We need to have all of that based on a solid foundation of science. These tools, these methods, this science can support decision support tools to enable forecast-informed reservoir operations. And those will yield benefits, we envision, for water security, flood control, ecosystems, hydropower, of incredible plethora of benefits. And it really requires an integrated, multidisciplinary strategy. Like I said, we need these scientists who have come up. I very much appreciate uh, Dr. Webb's summary of how an individual scientist's career path brought them to this position where they're so important to national security. The same is true in this area. Think of all the scientists and engineers that have to have the ability, the background, the know-how, and the resources to work on this together. We've, this is my sort of wrap up on where I think we're at uh, from my own personal myopic perspective, sort of from the trenches, although having been a scientist and program manager in NOAA, I've seen different sides of this. We've emerged into a new era, in my opinion, of use-inspired, collaborative, 
interdisciplinary cross or interagency and cross disciplinary work. We really need that long term observational uh, data set to work with. Uh, we have partnerships between universities, between academia and, and, and uh, agencies. Uh, we have different program management strategies from traditional grants programs to directed research to cooperative agreements to uh, uh, federal laboratory resources like Sandia we just heard about. All of those come together. In this FIRO work, the Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations, we have people from all of those different uh, sources of program uh, support uh, being involved. And I'd just like to close with one uh, major point is that in my experience, and I've talked, I've seen it in my own career path, but I've also talked to other people who you, you, if you were in the field, would recognize made a major contribution in a new area. They often tell the story of how the breakthrough advances that they're credited with came at great, with a great challenge. They were not programmed in, anticipated, systems engineered in, we know we need this result, so we're going to start funding it now. They often came from serendipitous results, from a fundamentally creative endeavor that science is. So I really support AGU's initiative here to support the basic science community that we depend on. Many of us, like myself, more of an applied scientist, we really depend on that fundamentally, and it really comes down to individuals. We need to give them time and room and support to be creative. It's expensive yet the benefits can be profound. And this just shows a loop of what atmospheric rivers look like when they hit Northern California a couple years ago, and in fact dumped over 25 inches of rain in three days. This is water vapor. You can see how fluid, the, uh, how dynamic the atmosphere is. Now imagine trying to monitor that carefully and predict it well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ralph, for showing us how a new area of exploration, atmospheric rivers, can help us better manage um, water supply and its relationship to security.